Um, cool. So, yes, as I was saying, um, it's, it's the most important thing about um, what we've been doing with Student Time is kind of having two streams of work going. Um, so one being very much about the future to kind of keep us honest in terms of what we're looking at in the present. Um, so rather than just kind of fixing things for now and, and you know, iterating on top of something that already exists, it's important to know that we're heading in the right direction so that we're thinking about stuff that, that's coming up and coming down the line. Um, so that's really been a big part of what it is we've been, we've been trying to look at. Um, as Aaron said, take notes, ask questions. Uh, nobody asks questions throughout, which is also fine, um, but if you want to, you're more than welcome. Um, one of the, the things that we l looked at a, a lot, I think, and actually this was, this is completely plagiarized, this whole first section, that was actually what Aaron uh, pitched to us when we first met, which was kind of strange. Um, but I thought it was a great way of setting up, I think a lot of this week is about change um, and about almost like next stage growth in terms of what we're, what we're doing as a product and the business. And uh, when you look at the history of stream time, um, you've kind of done this before, actually. It's not that hard. All of this is very, very manageable. And then this change is very comparable to stuff that has, has happened previously. Um, and in fact, this was stream time back in the day, particle systems. Um, and I think for around about then, that is what stuff looks like. Um, it was very sort of system generated and gray. Um, I always find it funny that kind of if you look about at movies just before this time, you can see what influenced design like this. <laughs> you know, it was when we were looking at things like in Blade Runner, or if you look back at old technology um, in movies, it's very black and green screens, and it's ones and zeros, and it's like that actually influenced a lot of what you see in uh, interface design today, uh, which is a little bit of a tangent. But <clears throat> stream time, and in not in fact stream time, but stream line, used to come in a box. Back in the days when we used to buy software in boxes. Um, and I think, you know, think about where we are now to where Streamtime was then, and we're not talking, we are talking about 10 years ago, which is not an incredibly um, large amount of time. So it came in a box, um, a very beautifully designed box, and the ads were about this product that came in a box. And of course, we were called Streamline, not Streamtime. Um, and Streamline obviously makes sense for making things more efficient and, um, and better in your business. Um, we were talking about how these ads always looked quite a lot like Apple ads um, back at that time as well, I'm sure um, not coincidentally. And who knew that Streamline had a manual? Back then, we had a manual for our product. Um, and it's not, you know, Zendesk. <laughs> it's a book about Streamline. So Streamline became Streamtime, it was still in a box. But then this stuff happened. So devices, iPhone, Apple operating system. And um, Streamtime was pretty much the, you know, one of the darling companies that Apple would feed, uh, feature in their ads. And so you know, that's a great kind of history to have and know that you know, Apple thinks pretty highly of Streamtime. Um, and so it was one of the, you know, when you only get to pick six apps to show in terms of iPhone in business and Streamtime is one of them, this is a, you know, a, it's a great place to be, something to be very, very proud of. And there was a lot of kind of design stuff happening back then as well. And um, yes, the word sexy was used to describe an interface. Um, which, to be honest, at that time was probably quite sexy compared to uh, even now some of the programs that you, that you have to deal with, as, as Damien sort of referenced earlier. Um, and I think that is, you know, we, we've talked about it once before already, but the bar is very low in this category. You know, the stuff that we have to use on a daily basis is, is terrible. Um, we, Damien talked about Interbrand quite a bit, um, where I used to work as well, and you guys will probably be familiar with a program called BCC. Um, we're looking at particle systems, BCC. You know, that's kind of what a lot of people are, are still using in their business. Um, and, and they're not moving, they're not demanding anything better. So, moving on from there, timesheets is nothing new either. Like, these have been the enemy of our industry for many, many, many years. And 
we tried to fix it back then and it was, it's definitely better looking um, as it currently is now as well. Um, but yet, it's the act of doing it. And, and it's the kind of the horror of having to go in at the end of the day or the end of the week or being chased by someone to go and have to do your timesheets. Um, I had, when I was RGA, I had a guy in my business who had not done his timesheets for three months. Um, he was on a hit list in New York and uh, I got him to do his timesheets. That's probably the most amount of praise I ever got in that job. But <laughs> it just shows you kind of how important that stuff is to, to some people. Um, but certainly not to the guy that created all the cool stuff in our office. Another big change. Moving away from the box, or kind of still slightly with the box, um, but moving away from annual subscriptions to monthly payment. That's a huge change. And that's a big kind of, it's a big jump to make in this industry at that time. And it's a, a big kind of sign of the times that that is the way everything was going. And so you can't resist change. You can't sit back. The only way to resist change is to die. Um, and so you can die and roll over and start again, or you can kind of constantly progress as you go. Um, and you can change from hair to no hair, it would seem as well. <laughs> um, and I, I just wanted to pull out, therefore, kind of in context, a lot that has happened over literally 16, 16 years. So started in 2006, a, a boxed product, stuff that you got sent or you had to pick up off the shelves. And to then get to, in 2008, one of the eighth um, fastest companies, fastest growing companies in New Zealand, um, abandoning kind of the boxed product, um, moving to a SaaS model. 2010, we're looking at $3 million in, in subscriptions. These are all kind of great you know, growth stories. Um, Launched a web product in 2013. Again, another significant piece of change, like how do you support stuff that's on the web versus how the stuff that comes in a box. <laughs> in a box, it's all kind of, at least you know what comes in the box. On the web, everything happens. You're suddenly open to lots of different um, operating systems, browsers, devices. Suddenly, we've got a whole thing to, to kind of work on to, to support. Um, and then, you know, even, if you think about kind of adapting to stuff that's been happening over time in terms of stopping print advertising, you know, what companies are still reading these magazines? You know, we know that often they're just the, especially in the industry press, who have been over here drowning um, because of things like Mumbrella. Um, so just stuff that comes on the internet, just stuff that is an email newsletter, um, and actually the magazines are just for show when clients come into agencies' receptions. Um, is anyone really reading them? Certainly not the industry. So I thought that all of that was kind of a nice backdrop to go, yes, we're going to talk about some stuff that's changing this week, and yes, some of it might feel a little bit scary, um, but I think it's anything really compared to that journey that, that you guys have already been on. Um, hands up who's been here like more than four years. Yeah, so roughly half. Like that's. You guys have been on some of these significant changes already, um, and I think that's kind of something that's good to, to think about. Um, and for those that are newer, like you've got people who have done this before, so you, you're able to kind of use them and, and learn from them. So what is happening right now? There are more project management software businesses than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> this does not even scratch the surface. Um, and so, you know, it's nice to sort of sit in your own domain and go, you know what, we're in a pretty good place. We, you know, we might be sort of top of the tree or t certainly in that top tier. And then suddenly anyone who can code, who gives a shit about project management can make their own. Um, and that can happen at, at any one point. The, the barriers to entry are tiny now. Um, and the interesting thing that's happening here is the, the fragmentation of how people are coming into this, right? They're not necessarily trying to create entire big project management systems. There are a few. I cannot escape these guys. No matter what website or Facebook page I am on, the Pulse is advertising at me, um, probably because I spend a lot of time looking at project management software. Um, but they are very, very aggressive. Um, but then you look at things like, Harvest, for example, who just, you know, yes, okay, they branched out a bit of it, but they're very, very, very focused on time. Um, 
Trello, which is literally just focused on the ability to, to manage a project and the tasks from one individual and across a, um, making sure things get done. Um, Slack, just communication within teams. So all of this is happening not just in the project management industry. You can see this happening in the financial services industry. Um, everything from kind of micro loans to peer-to-peer -peer loans to um, the way that you set up a savings account, they're all kind of taking nips out of the banking industry um, and the big banks. And the same is happening in this industry as well. Um, you've got to-do lists, you know, clear um, any do, to-doist. There's, you, you only got to look at pro productivity apps in the App Store and you will see hundreds of thousands. Um, there are a lot of them, some better than others. But it just shows you that actually the choice for people is, is pretty good nowadays. So we have specialists, you know, those ones that are kind of nipping in and taking just little bits, you know. Um, and we have integration. That is very, very much the big thing right now, right? You actually don't, even in some cases, you don't have to build a product almost. You just get to build an integration into a product. You know, Slack is a platform. Um, I read a great article recently by um, a company called Birdly, who, um, has anyone heard of that? Birdly? There, it's like an expenses um, system. So the, what their learning was that they could get maybe three out of 10 people to download this app in a team, but the point was that unless the rest of the team downloaded the app, it wouldn't work. So they were trying to kind of force behavior. And instead, they ditched the app, they ditched the product, and they just wrote an integration for Slack. And all they did was that you could now put, take a picture of your expense, put in a little bit of detail, send a message in Slack, done, it's logged. And so that is integration working kind of at its best. Now we've got integrations in terms of new e ecosystems popping up. So we've got Trello allowing Slack, Evernote, GitHub integrations. Also, back in the day, this wouldn't have even happened. These guys would be trying to create their own ward guard and make it all work on their own. Um, and now it's like you're open from the beginning. I've worked for companies that try to create walled gardens and they died pretty, pretty quickly um, because only one or two win. The rest of them don't have a hope in hell's chance. Um, rescue time is, an, is another interesting one. Heard of that one? So rescue time, I don't think they, I think it kind of works, um, but they allow or they read the software that is open on your system that you have in the main window and they look at a file name and they're able to match what you're working on based on what you're working on. So it takes a lot of kind of the, even just the manual part of having to track your time away. Um, so this stuff's coming, no one's executed it brilliantly yet, but it's, it's definitely coming. <coughs> Automation, similar, why do I have to input it? You know, like there are plenty of other things in the, in the world, as Damien talked about, the ability to kind of blur personal and work life. Why do I have to put the stuff in at the end of the day? I actually don't. You have a system open in front of you. It should be able to read what it is that you're doing. Toggle, time tracker are just some of the ones that, that kind of are already working on that. Iteration. So we will have heard of Basecamp. And now Basecamp is on to version three. And no one is, is saying that Basecamp, Basecamp isn't, um, like Basecamp has reached a peak. Right? They are constantly trying to improve their product. They don't stand still ever. The, the best way to defeat yourselves at this time is to stand still and not think that you can progress. Um, and even I used to work for a guy who famously reinvents his company every nine years and in fact is doing that m much quicker now as well. Um, and he reinvents the company at the time that is at the top of its game. If you are reacting because you're on the way down the slope, it's very, very hard to do that. It's actually almost too late. Um, you're kind of reacting for the wrong reasons versus actually reacting to be able to push yourself even, even further. And I think Basecamp is a really interesting way of doing that. Do I like the look of Basecamp? Do I like using it? No, not particularly. <laughs> but a bunch of people do, a lot of people do. And um, they do a very good job of kind of engaging people throughout that process and telling the story as well of how they do it. So obviously there's the signal versus noise blog, there's chats between uh, Jason Freed and Nate, whatever his name is, um, on YouTube that are very open, like from the minutia detail of, hey, what should we call this button? 
which was like the sign up button and they have this long conversation about, oh no, let's call it plans and pricing. No, let's call it sign up for a free trial. Let's call it 14 days free. But that's the kind of, that's how obsessed they are about their products. And that's why you can see that they have to iterate many, many times because they're kind of so obsessed about what's working and what isn't. And they know they can always be better. And they know if we went back to that kind of original slide that there are plenty of other competitors and there are new ones popping up all of the time. Yeah, they do a lot of A-B testing, yeah. Um, they do a lot of A-B testing, um, oh, but in some cases also, like, they're still not that huge, a team, and um, they just realize something isn't working. You know, they had, a, they had um, I think they moved the form on the home page once um, to the bottom of the page because it kind of looked ugly, the designer didn't like it at the top, and then a couple of months later they realized their sign-ups had really, really, really slowed down, and um, so they moved the form back up to the top of the page, but stuff, you can't think about that all of the time. Um, and as we were going through this process, uh, we spent a lot of time talking to other people, which is kind of weird for us because we were talking to our industry about something that we've actually quite, you know, we've kind of shunned. Um, and so this is from uh, one of your customers, in fact, who said, to be honest, I really don't want to know how much time we've spent on something. It's generally always more. You are never really being completely compensated. It's inevitable. We over deliver. That's our industry. <laughs> They're talking right there. You know, we, we are kind of very aware that we probably lose money on jobs, apparently. And yet we're not willing to do anything about it because we're not numbers people, right? It's funny, kind of you're talking to the creative industry about numbers, but it's not kind of naturally in our um, DNA. And you see things like this, and as Damien kind of touched on, I saw this hundreds of times. You got people killing themselves in your business. They're working late nights. You know they're working late nights because they're sending emails or they're coming in at the weekend. Um, and then you look at their timesheets and it said 7.5, 7.5, 7.5. So how can you even do anything with that? Like, I don't know how you can run a business with that. Yet we all know it's happening. And as the lady in the previous slide said, it's inevitable. But I wonder whether it is. And I think that's kind of one of the big kind of conclusions that we got from speaking to people is, really, does this have to be inevitable? Personally, when we started our business, we got rid of timesheets because of how crap they are and because of how inaccurate they are. Um, and because all I was really interested in was how much money came in that month and how much money went out that month. And it's very hard for someone to come and say to me, um, you're over budget. <coughs> This is constant. It's normally the finance director coming in going, you are way over on that job. Pens down, no more spend any more time on it. No more time. <laughs> Yet funnily enough, we work in a creative industry. And the hardest thing about the creative industry is trying to put a time limit on how long it takes to come up with something creative. <laughs> it's actually impossible. So all you can really do is manage the ins and the outs, but also understand what's working and what isn't. I think that, again, that's back to one of the points Damien made earlier, which is understanding the dynamics of how projects go and learning from them and being able to forecast them better rather than going, oh, brochure, yeah, 10 hours. <coughs> Flyer, a few hours. Oh, how long is that going to take? Oh, it's going to take this guy four hours, this guy four hours, that guy 10 hours, and we stick that into a system and we just let it go and we leave it and we go, meh, whatever. And then someone comes down and says, that's cost us. You've lost money on that job. But then I came out of a conversation at the end of that month we're with a 25% margin. How do we lose money? Like, we didn't lose money. So these are all the things that kind of went very personal. We, re we reacted to and started um, talking about when we set up our business. Um, and we don't need things like this in our lives. And these are the systems cause this from the people. So. What does that mean in terms of real, real context for, for stream time? Web usage, unsurprisingly, people are running away from the box. Um, it's on the rise. It's much easier to do stuff on a device or on multiple devices than it is on the computer that you are chained to at your desk. We are becoming slightly less sought after. This is visitors to streamtime.net. There is a lot of competition out there. It's pretty tough. And unsurprisingly, like that dip really isn't too bad considering the number of competitors. But 
it shows you something, right? It shows you that actually we, maybe we need to change something. So, to, to inspired by the rather large array of quotes that are around us on your bags and in your books <laughs> and on the walls, um, every success story is a tale of constant adaption, revision and change. A company that stands still will soon be forgotten. So I think if you haven't taken it out so far, there's the, like the concluding part. Um, and I'm going to very, very quickly talk about an industry that you're probably all very familiar with um, and that I used to work in as well, uh, which is print media. And we are seeing this, you know, they're, they're, in fact, we're, we're kind of almost on the way down the slope um, for print media as well. It's not going to die completely because people still like picking up stuff and sometimes still has a place, but it's not the mass anymore. Um, and I found this website, which was kind of cool, called magazinedeathpool.com. Um, and it introduces you as, uh, here is where the Reaper keeps its collection of magazines whom it has taken to the other side. Mm -hmm. Some of them were great ideas that didn't get enough ads. Some of them were great ideas that nobody bought on the newsstand. Some of them were just bad ideas in the first place and deserved an express ticket right onto the Reaper's boat. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you'll remember some of these magazines that have gone to a better place. It's a really basic website. You just scroll through. It's like hot or not for magazines. Um, but it's interesting because you can tell a very interesting story about what's happened here, right? And a lot of people kind of looked at the um, death of print media and magazines as really the biggest thing that was, was causing that was advertisers. And advertisers were flocking because they realized something that the magazines didn't, which was people weren't reading. And so when you become so focused on the wrong part of your audience, you see that you start putting out a, a worse product, right? And you start, what, what's the best way to make that up? Put more ad pages in. No, the advertisers are going, put more ad pages in. So I've worked on magazines that are like 50 to 60% advertising. Is that a good reading experience? No, not particularly. And also, as you're scrabbling around, you're getting really shitty ads. <laughs> so they're not even good ads to put into the magazines. And so we've seen declines, we've seen circulation declines um, as a result, and the whole thing has kind of worked against itself. Plus, we just know that devices are much more um, of, of a common case now um, than these things. So this is kind of sad, but at the same time, reality, that we're going to spend more of time on our phone. And, and commutes, we will spend you know, no time talking to people. Mind you, with everyone complaining that, oh, no one talks to each other on public transport, I'm not sure they did there either. <laughs> um, and so we're now at the case where the most important thing is the end user. And you hear a lot of stuff about design thinking, about user-centered design, about human-centered design, and it's because actually the end user does matter. And we are in a position now where not everything is run by the person that purchases the product or the software. We're actually run by the person that uses it. And that's so much more important. Um, so we don't get rage like this. Um, it also means that end users need stuff to be a little bit more fun. So does anyone use MailChimp? MailChimp. Yeah. Um, so this is just part of it. Yes, they're kind of fun little animations but they capture such awesome insights. You're about to send an email to 100,000, 500,000, a million people for some companies, and it's like, is everything correct? <laughs> <laughs> Am I gonna need to recall this and it's gonna be really embarrassing? Well, I'm really yeah. Exactly, you're literally sweating over the button. Um, and it's such, a great, it's such a great insight into how people use that, that software. And it's brought to life in just the right tone at just the right moment. Same for high fives, it's in the queue, great, phew, everything's good, off we go. Slack, so we did mention it a little bit earlier, um, but I've, I found Slack just a great um, story. Interestingly, um, our company was against Slack to begin with. Um, they did not want another piece of software. I have a little bit of a software fetish <laughs> and um, I'm constantly trying new things. Not everybody appreciated that within our business. And we could not understand why would we use Slack? Oh, well, it kind of, you can send messages to each other. I got email. It's like, email was fine. But actually, we hardly use email now. And so it's kind of to your point earlier as well about, you know, why do people change? People will just change, and it just takes some people longer than others. Um, Damien was against Slack. Um, 
But great story behind Slack, which we won't go into too much detail, but just a kind of a, a little bit of um, some of the insights I think that make it relevant for this. Um, and Slack wasn't even a community, they weren't trying to build a, a billion dollar communication tool, they were trying to build a video game. And they built a communication tool to be able to kind of help them do that and communicate better. Um, so then, that, you know, obviously as they get to the point where they realize their communication tool is better than the game that they built, um, they come to realize stuff like this. So most enterprise software looks like a cheap 70s prom suit, muted blues and grays everywhere. So starting with the logo, we made Slack look like a confetti cannon had gone off. Electric blue, yellows, purples and greens all over. We gave it the color scheme of a video game, not an enterprise collaboration product. And you all use Slack. And so th there's such a, a more exciting way of thinking because they built software for them, right? They didn't start with a, you know what, we have to sell this to big corporates and we have to get IT managers and procurement across the line. And so it's got to look like they would be happy with it. In fact, they don't even use IT or procurement. It's not even an equation in most of Slack's customers. People went and did it themselves and you got small teams. It's end user first, it's bottom up. It's not great big corporations signing leases um, or subscriptions to software. It's actually just the people who want to use it in their team and, and try that out. That's where we are now. We're not in the kind of big, hey, I need to sell you my box. Sounds strange. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so yes, so we know the story behind Slack. We know the phenomenal group uh, growth that they had from just realizing some of those dynamics that were happening as well, right? We can actually just keep going up and we can start working with the end user not the corporate at the, at the end of this. Um, and they realize that and the growth of that, and I'm sure there is a certain amount of people being able to take Slack with them and they might be freelancing in one company and suggest it to another company or move from one and move to the other. You know, it grows organically. It is like a virus, but in a good way. Um, so if you don't disrupt your business, someone else will do it for you. And you can see that. You know, so many businesses have been disrupted because they didn't move fast enough. They didn't even see what was going on in front of them or they had the wrong end goal in mind. Or, to quote somebody else that we know better, <laughs> giddy up. Seems appropriate to get that in somewhere. So now, what does that mean? Um, and I think, you know, we're at this is all very much work in progress that you're seeing. A couple more weeks would have been a little bit more finished, um, but it's good. I think you've also seen already a lot of work in progress. Um, hopefully I am better in the flesh than uh, in those horrible videos that Aaron made that he only really told us about about two months into working together, um, realizing that all of that stuff was being filmed. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna give you a bit of a sneak preview in terms of like what's coming up. Um, there will be more stuff throughout the week um, that, you know, Aaron's going to go into much more depth tomorrow about the product as well. Um, but this will whet your appetite, hopefully. So it's time for some real talk. All of this is kind of hints at what might be coming. And we thought we'd start by um, almost writing a bit of a letter to people in this industry um, and, our, and our customers. So. Dear creative industry, project managers, and frustrated founders, there are some things you're not so good at, and that's okay. We all have our faults, but to survive the changes that are coming down the pike, you have to start being honest with yourselves about how you work, about what the system you use are actually doing, about how your businesses are performing. So that's what Streamtime's here to do, to be the friend who'll have a laugh with you, but also call you on your shit. It'll be a shock at first, sure, but it's gonna pay off. It's gonna make managing jobs much less laborious, help you get more out of your studios and improve your understanding of how you work and what you can achieve. But don't worry, it's not all going to be tough love. Because the thing is, this self-serious culture we've created, well, it's pretty funny. And good-naturedly poking some holes in that will be a healthy good time for everyone involved. Oh, and spoiler warning, we're going to kill the timesheet. That's just the first of some pretty huge changes the culture of real talk is going to enable. But that's down the track for now. Let's start with two small truth bombs. Your hair looks a bit ridiculous when you have it like that. <laughs> and two, your best days are ahead of you. Lots of love, stream time. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, we should tell Matt that he, he got a small, I'm not sure how to describe it. 
<laughs> you will meet Matt tomorrow. You can give that to him. Uh, welcome to stream time. So there is a new stream time coming um, where the death of timesheets is just the beginning. And really what we're trying to do is kind of evoke the, the fact that you don't have to create separate communications when you have such a good looking product. You can actually combine the two much better. Um, so we are trying to create a much more human approach to creating tools for, unsurprisingly, humans. But who was that guy? <laughs> I think Aaron did send us a video that inspired that picture. <laughs> and we did not reply to it. We didn't reply to it. We did have a long chat about it, um, but I don't think we replied to it. And so there is a kind of a, a big part, I think, as we've been working on this and understanding what kind of makes stream time different and, and special. And um, there's a lot of crazy ideas that come out of that guy at the back in the towel. And so we thought maybe there's a way to th that this kind of product to be able to humanize it as well would be really good with a character. And so I'm kind of showing you some initial workings that we did to start, as we started to explore, like, who is this guy? What is this character? What's his role? Um, we have, maybe we'll, sh we'll just share it with you, actually. There's a character guide to some of the work that we've been doing, which is one of the best pieces of work I've, I think I've ever seen that Matt did um, in terms of explaining all of the aspects of this character and what it means and, and what it does. Um, and a guy on our team called Ben started playing around with what does this character do? Like, what does he look like? Um, how does he express himself? Um, what, what sort of form should he take? Um, we, we sort of, you know, in our conversations, found out a lot in terms of the obsession with pop culture, for example, in terms of like, you know, does he run around with a samurai sword and a toga, for want of a better word? Um, and then it was like, how do we find things? <laughs> it's a good job that wasn't the one that got up. Um, but then I think I watched another video, which was um, the uh, farmer's market thing that was in the big comp cooking competition that you all had. Um, I've seen, I think, most of your cooking videos. And uh, it was like, what can make this character a little bit more unique? And obviously, there was a, a flat cap. Um, and then this weird alcoholic red nose, which may only appear on mid by midnight this Friday, um, sort of emerged as well. And we started using that, and it didn't feel quite right. And one of the big things as we went through that was this is not a big character, right? The most important thing here is the product. Um, and that's the thing that we want to be able to kind of focus on. But this character does have a role. And actually the role of the character is to kind of be able to point stuff out and for show be useful and to make observations and to kind of have this sort of wit that, hey, we've been doing this for a long time. We can probably help you out with what's going on here in your business and in our product. Um, and so Ben started uh, experimenting with this kind of the way that we can almost simplify the character to the point where you can still just about get the expression and the feeling, um, but without going over the top in terms of too many features. And then when he's this small, like how do you still, how can you still kind of show that something's going on? Well, actually you've got to do a lot more with the limbs. And so by having these kind of weird, bendy, longer limbs, you exaggerate the expressions of the character at a very small size, which is what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to keep it very, very, very small. Um, and so, you know, he can do everything from slaving over the computer to um, meditation to running and catching his cap. And we've obsessed so much that there is a whole Slack conversation dedicated to the angle of this knee um, and whether it should be perpendicular or whether it should be a little bit more exaggerated. Um, a lot of thoughts gone into this. And so just this weekend, we were thinking, well, we kind of like where we're starting to go with this. Now we need to bring this tiny Aaron, <laughs> tiny Aaron. to life. So this is happening right now. Uh, well, what I wanted you to do was to come up here and mimic these actions at the same time. <laughs> He's got the red pants. He did have a heads up that wearing red pants today might be a good idea. Um, this is After Effects. So Ben is building this rig right now, and the beauty is that once we build a rig for the character, we can do whatever we want with it, and we can control it in, in lots of different ways. Um, so watch out. Um, it does get to the point, obviously we're just experimenting, where you kind of get Ministry of Silly Walks and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, 
But it means that we have now a character that can interact with the product, and that actually will be its role. So he gets to move across the screen. And that's not even good, that's me doing that. Um, but he can be really helpful within stream time. So you can see that you know, we're actually, one of the other pieces of work we're doing at the moment is streamtime.net. And how do we kind of sell the product? And it's really important that we sell it in a, in a very entertaining and engaging way. And um, we are thinking about how this character may navigate you from screen to screen. Um, and what sort of observations he makes about the, the product as he goes. So obviously that's, that's a nice part, but the most important piece to all of this was how do we um, redesign Streamtime? Um, how do we kind of address some of the frustrations that we've um, seen and observed? And we came up with these with seven principles. The first one, they're all kind of end user focused or begin with the end user, but automated wherever possible. The more work you have to do to put into the system, the, the, the more we've failed. We have to make this as easy as possible for you. Um, and yes, there's things about intuitive, but actually the, the, the things around automation is so much better. It's like you get there and something already happened. Or what might have taken you eight entries and clicks takes you to one. How do we keep kind of building that into what it is that, that we are producing for an end user? For owner and user, so yes, there are things that a business owner needs, but there are also things an end user needs to kind of keep them engaged and keep them um, driven to, to using the product so we get meaningful information out of it. Make it fun, seems like an obvious one, but you know, it isn't for so many pieces of software. And also, when you're up against it and you have a deadline, the first thing that gets cut is the fun stuff. And that's why so many pro pieces of software aren't fun. It's because they didn't have time to put them in and they shipped to what is becoming a, a terrible and overused term of a minimum viable product. Um, carrot over stick. This isn't about, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you haven't done this. It's about, yeah, you did it. Here's a reward. Here's something we can you know, enlighten, uh, kind of lighten the mood with because you did that. People, not numbers. We've talked about that already, but it's very much like this isn't just about numbers. I, I think to stuff like job numbers. Why do you need the job number? You only need the job number because the system output it and it needed an ID to be able to put all the information against. We don't need that anymore. Technology got better. No one size fits all. We're trying to find ways to personalize this as much as possible. So personalized dashboards, for example, um, which we haven't started working on yet, but they're coming. <laughs> um, and integrate behavior. The, the hardest thing to do with people as you are trying to change is to introduce some sort of new behavior to people. Um, and because that's its change and it's oh, I've got to learn how to do something differently. Great if we can relate it to something that you already do. So that's driven a lot of the, the thinking. So we went back to this, this thought that we'd written up on the wall. Timesheets are the devil. We need to fix them quickly. They're inaccurate, demotivating and more care is given to their output than their input. It's a vicious cycle. You have to get really angry about this stuff to do something quite dramatic <laughs> about it um, and dramatically different. Uh, so we said, no more timesheets. Let's replace them. We need something much, much better. And so what we have now is to-do lists. <laughs> so what we worked out was that people do have to-do lists, right? In a number of different ways. Some people have apps on their phone. Some people just write a little to-do list. Even one agency that we interviewed through this process they actually designed and printed out paper timesheets for everyone to record things that they were doing and then someone else had to enter them manually into a system. That's how much they hated using the system. Um, but here we thought, well, actually it'd be much better to just create a to-do list that people can use. Oh, and by the way, once you've done something, it logs time. You didn't have to do anything. So you don't have to go into your timesheet, you just have to do your to-do list. Um, and we can bring some fun elements to it, like Tiny Aaron sat on the to-do going, hey, relax, it's Monday, not doomsday. And this button, which you will see more of tomorrow, I think, yes, it exists, um, which is that can populate everything for you, right? Don't come in and create lots of to-dos because that sounds pretty daunting. Everything's already in the system. We can just do it for you. That's OK. Um, so there's magic buttons within the new product. Um, 
And so the whole idea of that, of that to do is that this is people, not numbers, right? This isn't you entering numbers for the system. This is actually you using a to-do list for yourself. And the, the bonus and the payoff is that we take that information and we can use it to help you understand how projects are going. Um, so you will have seen the agenda already, which was excellently created in this new, new product feature. Um, but you'll get to see more of this tomorrow, I think, when Aaron takes you through the product. But to be able to kind of add items in and drop them down to done and press tick buttons to say, you know what, yeah, that's everything I did yesterday. I don't need to do anything more. I don't need to add anything else in. I can just tick that, it's all done. No one mentioned the words timesheets. And we can have fun at the end of the week when everything is done. Um, then we've looked at how can we make some of the, there are pages where you do need a um, lot of information um, and we, you know, there is a reality of a job management page based on the kind of existing product and being able to design a new version on top of it. Um, but we've introduced some things that we think can make this even better. So, um, for example, this, which won't necessarily look like that, um, but having some sort of project management overview statement which is dynamically generated for you to be able to go, hey, this project is doing fine. You are 50% of the way through the, product, the project. Um, you look like you will finish on time. But Joe Roker just spent 80 hours in one week on this project. That's a nice flag to get, to be able to understand that you shouldn't be doing 80 hours in a week, for example. The system can tell you this stuff. We have all this information. The beauty of it as well is, is that you could maybe pick up that kind of paragraph and send it to your boss to get them off your back and say, hey, this is how the project's going, everything's good. We can make it easy to add team members. Um, so there's kind of design and aesthetic updates as you, as you go through this, um, encouraging photos, encouraging names, not numbers. Um, and then being able to, you, you remember the it's time for real talk slide at the beginning with all the colors. Um, we're looking at how we might be able to introduce those colors as you just roll over and kind of get this sort of piano-y effect down. Oh, yeah, so it looked pretty cool, like a rainbow. Oh um, more excitement. Um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> So there will also be a new way of talking, um, but I'm not going to take you all through that now. You have a very entertaining session with Matt tomorrow on how to write stories, how to write better in general, and how to kind of write and talk in the way of the new stream time. Um, Matt practiced on our whole agency on Friday, and it was pretty cool. You will hear about ninjas, action films, Breaking Bad, comics um, and that sorry power no power rangers no power rangers he keeps that very separate in his life yes <laughs> lots of yes puddle water um, so there'll be a new way of talking that is coming and there will also be a new way of working um, which we'll talk about I think on Thursday um, but uh, that will be more of a kind of a fluid session of how you respond to stuff like this and what you get over the next few days because we want to be able to go and work with you guys and to what do you think you now need to do in your day jobs to be able to adapt to this new world. You know, we've painted the future, we've painted what's happening right now. What does that mean for, for what you do day to day? So, take aim. We are going to have a crack at the uh, competition and knock them down. Um, Excuse my keynote skills. I could not get, I could not get that thing to shoot. Um, had I had Ben at midnight last night, that thing would be shooting, um, and these things would be moving. But I think it's a great opportunity. You guys are in a great spot. Um, you are clearly a great team, and the fact that everyone is here to be able to talk about this stuff this week um, is is pretty exciting. And you're going to see other exciting stuff. But I would encourage you to think about what it all means. And so that this week isn't just a awesome, we got everyone together in Sydney, and for some of you, you got a great holiday out of it as well, um, but it's actually, we've got a chance here to do something pretty special, right? You know, there's people who didn't even try and make a billion dollar company made a billion dollar company. Um, you've got a great opportunity here to change some stuff up and to kind of support it and to be able to bring it to life. So, good luck with all of that. Thank you.